In this video, I'll go through a statistical data analysis using Excel. So here's our example data set, and it consists of the number of letters in the first and last names of 16 Math 1901 students. One way to summarize this data set is to draw a dot plot. And the way to construct the dot plot is to, first of all, identify the minimum and maximum numbers in the data set. So the minimum in this case is nine, and the maximum is uh, 16. And then draw a number line going from nine up to 16. And make sure that it's, it's a proper number line. So it's got all the numbers in between equally spaced. And then we put a dot above each number of each observation in the data set. So 12, there's a dot here. 13 is, is this one. 14 is this one. All the way through to the end, the last one, nine is this one. Okay, and that gives us a quick visual impression of the data set. Another way is to draw something called a stem and leaf diagram or stem and leaf plot. So here's what the stem and leaf plot looks like for this data set. Uh, in this case, the axis is, is vertical rather than horizontal. And this piece is called the stem. This gives the, uh, in this case, the tens digit. And then uh, we've, we've got a line down here to separate the leaf. This is the leaf part and the, the numbers in the leaf tell us the, the ones digit. So the first observation is 12. So it's, it's one in the tens unit and two in the, in the ones unit. So that's 12. And then 13 is, is in the same, same row because I've got 12 and 13 in this row, 14 and 15 in this row, 16 and 17 in this row. Okay, and so on. And again, it kind of gives a nice uh, visual impression of the, the distribution of the data. Okay, how about some numerical summaries? So mean, median, quartiles, range, interquartile range. Uh, so for that, I'm going to move to Excel because uh, it's a little easier just to get all the, all the values that we want using Excel. So let me just switch over to Excel. Okay, so I've got my data over here. Okay, and one way to start analyzing some data is to actually reorder it. So I'm going to copy it into column B, uh, but then I'm going to reorder this, this data set. So if I go to data and then sort, and then hopefully I'll be able to reorder it from smallest to largest. Okay, I didn't actually want to do that. I just wanted to do, okay, there we go. Okay, and <clears throat> when I've got it reordered like this, it means I can calculate things like the median and the quartiles a little more easily. Uh, but let's go through and, and calculate some of those summaries. So the mean. So this is equal to the sum of all the data divided by the sample size. And there's 16 observations, 16 students were um, used for this data set. So 12.5 is the mean. Uh, the median, so let's, let's divide our data set up into four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the top half of the data set. Actually, maybe I can color that a different color. Uh, let's color that, uh, I don't know, this color. And then let's make the bottom half uh, another color. Uh, let's say this color. Okay, so I've divided the data set, the ordered data set into two halves and the median 
uh, is the average of those two numbers in the middle. If I had an odd size data set, then it, there would be a unique number in the middle. But because n equals 16, it's an even number, there's two numbers in the middle. So I have to take the average of those two numbers, which will be 13 in this case. Okay, how about the lower quartile? Well, the lower quartile, we take the lower half, okay, and then find the median of the lower half. So it's going to be the average of those two numbers uh, in the middle of the lower half. So it'll be 10.5. And then the upper quartile, unsurprisingly, is in the middle of the upper half of the data. So it'll be the average of those two numbers. Uh, the range is going to be the difference between the maximum and the minimum. So it'll be 16 minus nine. And the interquartile range will be the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. So it'll be 3.5. Okay, and the interquartile range tells us the range of the middle half of the data from the lower quartile to the upper quartile. There's half of the data set in that, in that range is the middle half. Okay, how about some graphical summaries? So let's draw a histogram and a, and a pie graph. So before we can draw a histogram, we have to create a frequency table with uh, equal sized intervals. So my intervals are gonna be nine to 10, 11 to 12, 13 to 14, and 15 to 16. Okay, uh, how many numbers between nine and 10 have we got? Uh, looks like four. How many between 11 and 12? Three. How many between 13 and 14? Uh, looks like six. And how many between 15 and 16? Looks like three. And let's just check that adds up to 16. Uh, four and three and six and three. Yes, that comes to 16. Okay, now I can select that data range. And if I do insert, and then let's pick a bar chart. It'll do a little bit of calculating. Hopefully it won't take too long and it'll draw me a bar chart. And this, this is a histogram of our data. Okay, and I can, I can uh, kind of play around with this a little bit. Um, let's see, I could add a title for that, uh, so this is number of letters in the uh, first and last names of uh, Math 1901 students. Uh, this axis here, I could add that too. Um, is that the vertical axis? And this could be the frequency. Okay, uh, I, can, I can do all kinds of things. If I double click on the bars, It'll uh, allow me to change, change some things about the bars. So I can make the gaps a little bit smaller, which is often a good idea with, with histograms. It's actually quite nice if, they're, if the bars are right next to each other. Actually, let's put a little bit of, a bit of a gap in there, 15%, there we go. So that's, that looks a little better to me. Okay, so that's a histogram. Let's uh, just move that a little bit out of the way here. And then let's draw a, a pie graph. So for a pie graph, uh, a pie graph doesn't have to have the same uh, intervals in it that the histogram did, uh, but just for illustration, uh, I'm gonna use the same ones. but uh, you need not use the same ones. You could use different intervals for the pie graph. And for the pie graph, they need not be the same size. Uh, for the histogram, uh, you have to have them the same size. Uh, but the pie graph is this one here. Okay, that one came up a lot quicker. Okay, and again, we can kind of play around, maybe uh, change the title. Uh, we could, instead of having the legend down there, I think you can uh, you can double click on it. Oops, not just one point. I want to double click on the whole thing. Here we go, and 
Uh, I could move it to maybe have it over there. Um, I could add data labels, which is often a good idea for a pie chart. And I could have those, oh, let's see, maybe on the outsides. And these are just the, um, the counts, but uh, I could change that to be the percentages instead. Okay, so there's uh, the pie chart. Okay, let's go back to the, um, the whiteboard. Okay, and let's think about uh, some probability. So we got 16 students, okay, up here, represented by these, this data for the number of letters in their first and last names. What if we picked one of those students at random? What is the probability that the number of letters in their first and last names is greater than 15? Okay, so how do we calculate that? Well, let's look at our data in, in, the, in, the, dot, in the dot plot here. Okay, there's only two students with more than 15 letters in their names. So the probability is going to be two out of 16. Uh, if I reduce that to simplest form, it'll be one out of eight. If I express it as a percentage, it'll be 12.5%. Okay, so that was fairly straightforward. What about if we pick two students though? What is the probability that both of them have more than 15 letters in their first and last names? So let's think about picking two students. We'll first of all pick one student, figure out the probability for the one student, and then we'll figure out the probability for the second student. Okay, so for the first student, we already figured that probability out. That was two out of 16. Let's think about the second student though. Okay, if we've already picked a student with more than 15 letters in their first and last names, it was one of these two students. I suppose it was this one. Okay, now I've only got 15 students left to pick from and only one of them has more than 15 letters in their first and last names. So the probability for the second student is one out of 15. Multiply those two fractions together, we'll have two times one in the numerator, 16 times 15 in the denominator, and simplify, and I'll get one out of 120, which as a percentage is only 0.83%. It's really unlikely that if I pick two students at random, I'll pick the two students that have more than 15 letters in their last name. Okay, that brings us to two questions. Pick two students at random from this class of 16. What is the probability that the number of letters in their names is less than or equal to 15 for both? Okay, so use the same idea as we just went through. Okay, this problem here. But this time, we're thinking about the probability that the number of letters in their, la in their first and last names is less than or equal to 15 for both students. And again, think of picking one student and then another student and multiply those two fractions together. Second question. Okay, let's go back to our data set again. This, this was our data set here represented in this dot plot. Suppose one of, these, uh, one of these students with 16 letters in their first and last names, suppose they, they gave us wrong information, okay? They don't have 16 letters in their first and last names. They have 32 letters in their first and last names. How would the mean and the median change if that student, instead of 16, had a data value of 32. 